trials we may face, whatever fears confront us, that you would give us the victory, that you give us eyes to see, that we would be able to pray like Job prayed, yet he slay me, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. We would offer ourselves to you knowing that you are working in all things for the good of those who love you, even in the trials, even in the suffering, even in the unknown, in the tests of our faith, that you are working, that you are the God who seeks and finds us, those who are lost, and you call us back to yourself again and again. May we be found in you, our Lord. And give us the victory in Jesus Christ in all things. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Well, we appreciate everyone's patience this morning. Um, sometimes things uh, just break, and uh, there's nothing we can do about it. So, but he's here. He's always here, and all the more so when we invite him to be here with us. It's a good morning. Yeah, yeah. I mean, all this stuff, but. It's a good morning. Do you, need, do you need the Lord today? I sure do. Hey, if you're new with us, uh, whether you're here with us in the room or if you're with us online, um, we would like to make sure that we connect with you. Uh, there's a few ways you can do that. Um, you can come to the five-minute party, which is going to be at the end of worship today. Uh, so if you're here with us uh, live in person, uh, just head into the social hall, find a green tablecloth and a little table tent that says five-minute party. We've got a gift for you. And the party really will only last about five minutes, so it's not a big drawn-out thing. We just want to get a chance to visit a little bit, get a chance to answer any questions you may have about the church. And we have a gift for you, so I hope you'll take advantage of that. And also, if you're new and want to connect, um, what you do is you just text the word NEW, N-E-W, to 360-844-3011. And what that does is it shoots you into our uh, church text messaging system, and you'll get a little uh, throwback message to get, get a little bit more information about you. You can use that as a communication line, uh, so the church can receive text messages as well as voice calls. Uh, if you want to text us, use the 30, uh, th- uh, 844 3011 number. Uh, if you're just calling the church office, 692 9813. We're going to be, um, first, we're going to be taking an offering. And. Um, And then secondly, we are going to begin, we're going to begin the time of Holy Communion. Uh, So we're going to walk through and talk through uh, the first portion of the service. We're not actually going to serve the elements until the end of the message today. Uh, Today's message will be a deeper invitation into the Lord's table. It's all going to make sense uh, once uh, once Pastor Dave's done with this message. So... um, if you have a gift that you'd like to give today, you can go ahead and uh, uh, put that on the plate as it comes by. Uh, or if, you've, uh, if you have to write a check and you got to make time for it later on, we got a box that says that go, the offering box right in the center aisle uh, just as you exit the room. Uh, you can also go to silverdalechurch.org slash give and you can give there. So we got a lot of different ways we can do that. And uh, with that, I'd like to ask our... Uh, Uh, ushers that they come forward and then we will continue on in this time of worship. During a time of offering, we're going to be playing a new song. This is called Christ, Our Hope in Life and Death. We'll be learning this throughout this month. And it's really asking the question, why do we gather? What is our hope found in? And so I hope this song will be an encouragement to you, but also maybe a way that we can use to give an answer to those around us as to why we have hope in the midst of trials 
and hard seasons.
repents. This is the word of God for the people of God. Not sure whether I should dare to try to speak or not, whether mic will work or not. How are we doing? Is that, can you hear me? Good. Is the mic working? No? No. Okay. I can get really loud, so hang on. Just don't turn it on all at once when it works. We broke the communion service in half for a special reason. I want you to sit for a few minutes and, and, and think about the elements of the communion. They're set aside for you, the body and the blood of Christ, represented by a piece of bread and a cup of wine or grape juice. It represents that Jesus has forgiven you, made a way for you to come home, that he loves you, that he treasures you, that he gave everything he is, his life, to save you. He doesn't ask you to be different. He died while you were yet sinners, we read this morning. He died for us while we were all yet sinners. He didn't say you have to be perfect to come to me. He said you have to come to me and I will make you perfect. I will transform you. And before we come to the communion, I want you to come the right way. To come knowing that he is welcoming you today. He wants to save us, change our lives, fix us. I got that. He wants us to repent. I got that. But he says, I love you first, and I died for you while you were yet a sinner, and I am going to change your life. The goal of this message today is to do something very simple. I want you to come knowing that you are a treasure of God, that he loves you, that he cares for you, that you've already accomplished what you need to do to earn your own salvation. That's nothing. He's done it for you and for me. He has given his life to save us. And it's not that we have given our best to earn his approval in our lives. If you were running a sound system in a church, (laughs) to use a contemporary illustration, and it wasn't working, you know what you'd do? You'd go and do whatever you could do to turn that thing back on, wouldn't you? You'd give your everything if that thing would work for a moment. I had an experience like that one time. We bought a coin, gold coin, the $20 St. Gaudens gold coin, 1908. Mint State 65. It was going to be part of our great investment. And I went to check out my wonderful treasured coin one day, and I looked where I kept it in the box marked treasured coin. Nobody open, please. And I looked inside, and it wasn't there. Let me ask you what you think I did. How many of you think, just for a show with a raise your hands, that I ran up the stairs and said, Nancy, Clarissa, guess what? This treasured coin that I bought with all of our inheritance is gone. Isn't that great? (laughs) I'm going to tell you I didn't do that. I didn't do that. I'll tell you what I did. I was embarrassed. I thought, how did I do something so dumb? Uh, Of course, I knew the answer to that. But (laughs) Nancy's laughing. How could I make such a mistake? It happens, doesn't it? Here's a story, and I'd like you to read it with me again. I hope you have your Bible open in front of you, Luke 15, uh, verses 8, 9, and 10. It starts out this way, but right at the verses 1 and 2, they're having a, a meal, and Jesus is eating dinner with sinners and people who were ungodly. And then there were some Pharisees and the tax collectors who are very godly people. 
And they looked at Jesus and they said, how can this be? He's eating dinner with sinners and tax collectors. What is the problem? Anybody knows that if he has standards at all, he shouldn't share a meal with unholy people because they haven't done enough. And the, the question is going to be, how much is enough? They haven't done enough to be holy. They haven't, they needed to do three things, the Pharisees said. They needed to confess their sins, every last one of them. They needed to pay for their sins, every last one of them. And third, they need to live a holy life and not ever fail again. The Pharisees were so worried that they wouldn't do well enough in life that they made it harder and harder and harder. So he couldn't even associate with people who were sinners. And they looked at Jesus and they said, he's sure a nice guy. He teaches so well, but look, he eats dinner with sinners. What is his problem? He can't belong to God. And so they shook their heads and they didn't want anything to do with him. So Jesus told them a story about a, a man who went out to look for sheep. And he found his sheep. Amazing thing is they didn't like shepherds because they weren't very holy people either. So Jesus told them another story. If they weren't already furious, he told them another story about a woman. And now they're really mad because, you see, they didn't like that um, a woman could be the hero of the story. And so Jesus tells a story, and it goes like this. There's a setup and a conclusion, start and finish. There's a middle where she loses the coin and a middle where she finds the coin. Here's the way it goes. Just the way John read it. Suppose there's a woman, and every one of those Pharisees, they were just gritting their teeth. Because they wanted it to be a story about a heroic Pharisee, not about a woman. But he tells it anyway. He says, there's a woman. She had ten coins. She loses one. She loses one. So she makes an action plan. This is the middle section. She lights a light. She sweeps the house. And she searches with passion until she finds it. And then when she finds it, she calls all of her friends, she makes an announcement, and they gather together, friends and family, and they celebrate. And Jesus says, in the same way I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of, God, of the angels of God when one person, when one person, when one person here says, you know what? I believe that God could love me in Jesus Christ. I think I'm going to come forward because I know that Jesus loves me and that he gave his life to die for me. I'm going to come forward because I know I don't have to impress anybody or live up to anybody else's standard, not the Pharisees, not the Sadducees, teachers of the law, none of them. Because God loves me while well, I am just the way I am. The setup for the story is just super, super simple. Just a super simple there is a story. There's a woman, she has 10 coins. I'm going to go to the start and walk my way through quickly. There's a woman, she has 10 coins, and I want you to think how she feels for a moment when she loses one of them. How would you feel if you lost your precious coin? Or if you were in charge of something and it didn't work? <laughs> you'd cry out, yeah, there you go. I think you'd feel ashamed, wouldn't you? You'd feel humiliated that you'd done your best and this was it and you'd lost it. She was alone in her house, all by herself, nobody to share it with, nobody to help her, nobody in that house came over and says, you know, I, I, I see you've got a problem let me help you. Maybe you feel that way too. Maybe nobody knows the secrets, the things that you've lost. We know the doors were closed in this house. She has to light the candle to see. She has to light the oil lamp to see. A house in the ancient world, we know, is made out of uh, a peasant house. This is a poor woman. It's a peasant house. It's made out of black basalt, the same kind of rock that we have in our community. It's stacked up into a house. It would be the size of a garage. So your sink, not your double stall garage either, a single stall garage. So it's going to be 10 feet wide and about 20 feet long. That will be your house. 
It's dark because it's solid rock walls. It has two or three little windows in it. There are slits about this wide so nobody can break into your house in the middle of the night. And they're about this tall so there's a little bit of light. How much light do you think comes through a little hole like that if you live inside of a black cave? Not much. That's where this woman is all alone inside of her house. She's lost her coin. She knows it's there. She hasn't anybody to blame, so she goes and looks for it herself. And it's in the secret of this looking that she is desperate. And it says as she cleans her house, she sweeps it with passion, diligently. She looks at full of stress because she has lost her coin. She wants to answer the questions, how did I lose it? Where did I lose it? What was I doing? I surely can trace my coin backwards. I can surely save myself by finding my coin, can't I? I can undo all this by, by looking for the coin. It must be here somewhere. Imagine the house now is 10 feet, it's like from here to the end of there, that's her whole house. She picks up the refrigerator, she looks under the microwave, she moves the television, she looks you know what kind of floor they have? It's black basalt floor. Have you ever built a rock wall? You ever think how smooth it is? How nice and even? Well, that's what her floor is like. It's full of holes and cracks and crevices and the coins in one of them. And she has to move everything. She gets out her little broom. She gets on her knees and starts sweeping from one end to the other because the longer that coin is lost, the worse it gets. And she's going over every square inch of her tiny little house. She's thinking, my life is ruined. We don't know where the coins came from. Could have been a dowry. Could have been her husband gave it to her, but there's no mention of a husband. If there is a husband, he's going to come home and say, uh-oh, is this some kind of Freudian thing where you're trying to tell me something you don't want me in the house? You know, what's going on? Are you rejecting? We don't know. Could be your treasure. It's her banking. There wasn't a bank in the olden days, so they carried their money with them. But this is all she's got. It's Ten days wages. It's a denarius. The coin is a drachma or a denarius. It's a day's wage. And she's lost it. She's got ten of them total. That's all the money she's got in the whole world. She carries it with her. She's lost 10% of everything, but more than that. She's lost her reliability and her trustworthiness because the coin that she was tasked with taking care of, she has lost. And she will, now, many of you know, if, if I gave you just a, a blank piece of paper and, 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 and a pencil, you could write down all the things I'm saying. It's just so clear. How would she feel about herself? At this point, she happy. She run upstairs and say, "Hey, everybody! Guess what? I lost my coin. I feel so good. I've got nine more. Ha <laughs> ha! Cool." No. She doubts herself. How could I do this? What's wrong with me? Am I losing my memory? I know I had it here somewhere. That's how she feels. And she looks in her life and she wonders. What will my neighbors think next? Maybe you've thought that. Maybe you think if somebody only knew what you've lost and done wrong, things you've misplaced or mistook or missed something, they're going to look at you and say, uh, I always knew it. Underneath that shiny, smooth exterior is a coin loser. <laughs> And even though it's kind of funny in one sense, it's tragic. Because that's how so many of us feel. That if only we had to tell the truth, we wouldn't quite live up to it. She has an action plan. Remember when you were a kid, there was a, the thing about the guy who was lost in the mountains and there was 10 feet of snow that fell on the ground that night and he's wandering through the 10 feet of snow and he comes into a cabin out in the mountains and there's a, a, a wood stove and there's a lamp, and there's a match, and he's about to freeze to death, which one does he light first? Now, I was in fifth grade before I realized that the answer is he lights the match first. She 
She lit the candle, and she started looking. She did what she could with what she had. And Jesus, as he tells this story, you can imagine her in, the, in, in this little tiny dark cabin on her hands and knees, sweeping in the grit and the gravel and the broken rock pieces, trying to put her life back together, looking in the dark corners of the things that are lost. She explored everything, reviewed every action. Now, I got up, I went over to the refrigerator, opened the fridge, poured the orange juice, made breakfast, cleaned my dishes, put them in the dishwasher, and I know I had my, and she's going to go through the whole day looking. And I know more than a few of us have spent years looking for the peace that will make it right again. We look and we look and we look for how to find the peace that makes it right. Now, don't worry, it's going to turn out okay in the end. She finds her coin. And in one sense, this parable is about working until you find it. But that's not what Jesus had in mind here today, so don't jump to conclusions. She finds the coin, and as surely as he did three things before she lost it, she does three things after she finds it. She calls her friends and her neighbors. She calls her women friends and her family. And she makes an announcement. This is a verbatim quote of the lost sheep that we just read. So she first talks to her neighbors, and then she's going to make a declaration, which even though it sounds short, it's an action step in the story. And she says, thirdly, rejoice with me. I have found my lost coin. They didn't even know about it, but now they're coming over to rejoice. And she celebrates. And everything in her life changes in that moment from quiet and hiding and desperation and looking and loneliness and fear that someone will discover what she has done wrong, she says, look, I'm okay again. I found my lost coin and I'm thrilled. Now, if you don't know the first part about the Pharisees, you'll think, oh, isn't this wonderful? If we just look hard enough, we'll find Jesus and everything would be okay. I'm like the woman looking for Jesus and I'll be good. But I want you to think if that's what's really happening here because in Jesus says in the same way in heaven. The angels who stand in the presence of God are rejoicing when one lost coin, when one lost sinner is found and re repents and is found. The coin is you. You're not the woman. Jesus is the woman. And the, fear, the Pharisees are just infuriated by this. And Jesus doesn't care. Because he says, look, I am so humble. I'm like a shepherd looking for a sheep. I'm like a woman looking for a coin because I love my coin. I love my lost sinners so much that I will crawl on the floor I will light the lamp. I will come down to earth and I will give my life to find you. But I will find you because I treasure you like crazy. You mean more to me than you'll ever know. And, you, and, and you'll say, but I'm just a lost coin. I'm, I'm, I'm useless. I'm no good. I'm a lost sheep. I'm a wandering sheep. I, I always wander. You know how it is. I've got a wandering issue. And, 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 and the shepherd, he doesn't say, you know, I, I, you're right. You're out of here. No, the shepherd says, I'll find you wherever you are, and I'm going to bring you home. And I want you back in my house. But I'm not good enough. The Pharisees tell me I'm no good. I haven't confessed every one of my sins, and I got a lot. I haven't paid for them, and I, I, I couldn't if only you knew what I'd done. And I can never demonstrate my holiness by living a perfect life because I'm just not that good. And Jesus', is par Jesus parable is trying to say this to you. I know you're not. 
And stop trying to be, would you? Stop trying to be a Pharisee. And let me bring you home. Come to me the way you are, and I will take you. I will fix you, and I will bring you back and put you in your place again in the crown of ten coins that would be on her forehead like a, a peasant woman might wear. Or I will put you back in the pen where the sheep are kept. Or in the next parable that comes the prodigal son, I will bring you back into the house and I will celebrate when you're home. Could you believe for a moment? Now I know some of you don't have this problem, but I know some of you do and I want to talk to those of you who do. Could you believe for a moment that as imperfect as you are, as imperfect as I am, that the angels rejoice at the sight of you coming home? That in heaven, when you come forward and you say, I want to give my life up and I want Jesus to be my Savior, that in heaven they're dancing. I don't know if they dance in heaven, but if they do, they're dancing. Other than that, they're just rejoicing. Could you believe that the God of heaven loves you and is crazy about you and wants you to come home and let him restore you to your place? When the son came home, that rotten, no good son that ran off with the old man's money, the father saw his son back, and the son tries to buy his way back into the good graces with the, with the old man. And the old man puts his ring on his finger, puts his coat on his shoulders, and says, we're going to celebrate, and the whole village will be here. I'd like to ask you, when you come forward to now, this morning, to let that be the picture that God is celebrating and saying, I'm so happy to see you. Will you pray with me? Lord God, bring us home. We wander so far. We have private thoughts. We have things we think about. If only, if only, if only, if somebody knew, if somebody understood, if somebody looked at me and saw how lost I am, maybe we'd never be able to show our face again. Lord, take that away and remind us that we belong to you, that you have given your life everything so we don't have to be afraid again, that we can come to you in Jesus Christ, our Lord and our complete Redeemer. Amen. At this point, uh, Pastor John will lead us through the second half of the Lord's Supper together.
despised by the world as a wondrous attraction for me. For the dear Lamb of God left his glory above to Cherish the old rugged cross. Till my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange its sun. suffered and died to pardon and sanctify me. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down. I will please Cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange its sun.
Come with 